Welcome, everyone. Um, as most of you know, I'm Cecil Gregoriades, Director of Communication and Marketing at Ecol Belong. Welcome to our third parent webinar. The topic today is tips to keep the calm at home with your child during the pandemic. We have four presenters today. Uh, first presenter is Carla Maya. She, Carla has 17 experience, years of experience working as a lower school counselor and social emo emotional learning specialist in international schools in the US, Portugal, and Brazil. And Carla is currently a school counselor working primarily with preschool and younger elementary students at EB. Our second presenter is Douglas Gosling. Douglas has a dual license as a marriage, family, and child therapist, and is a licensed professional clinical counselor. He's currently a school, a school counselor at Ecole Bilang. He's also a high school placement counselor, and he works primarily with older elementary and middle school students. Our third presenter is Christopher Colburn. Christopher has been teaching SEL for five years now at EB. He's received his uh, training in SEL from Mindful Schools and in Conflict Resolution and Restorative Justice Practices from SEAS Community Resolution Center here in Berkeley. His role is to help children better regulate, regulate their emotions, learn how to read emotions in others, build positive self-esteem, learn how to calm the body and the mind and show empathy and compassion for others. Our fourth presenter is Magali Noth. Magali actually spearheaded social and emotional learning, uh, the social and emotional learning program at EB when she started working here 11 years ago as a Dean of Students. She has formal training in SEL applied to the field of education. So the way uh, it's gonna work today is our presenters will talk for about 25 to 30 minutes and then a participant can ask questions. We'll take the questions that were submitted in advance and we'll also take questions live. Um, so you can ask your questions in two ways. You can either chat with us all throughout, throughout the session and we'll, we'll keep track of the questions being asked or you can wait until the end and ask your questions by raising your virtual hand um, on Zoom. If you don't know how to do that, you just have to click on participants. And then next to your name, you should be seeing a virtual hand, a little hand um, logo, and you can just press that when you're ready to ask your question. And we'll see that. Um, we'll just take you in order of first come, first serve. All right, we can get started. All righty, hello and welcome. I'm glad you guys are all here. What we'll do is we'll start with a guided meditation. It's something typical of what I do in the SEL classes at school. All right, so we'll start with three deep breaths. Okay, and you can close your eyes now and just listen to my voice as I'll guide you through this very brief meditation. All right, so make sure that you're sitting in a way that your spine is straight and uh, but somewhat relaxed. Now just focus on your normal breathing. And if your mind starts to wander during a meditation, that's okay. You can always just come back to your breath. Your breath is your anchor. All right. Now relax and try to be fully in this moment. Think nothing else but your breath. Now I want you to think of someone in your life that you are grateful for. If you could see them or be with them, what would you say? Think about how this feeling you have when thinking about your gratitude towards them makes you feel. Now I want you to feel that same gratitude for yourself. You are worthy of the same gratitude. Be good to yourself. 
show the same care you show for others to yourself. All right. Now you can open your eyes and we'll begin. Thank you, Christopher. Good morning, everybody. So um, what we just experienced with Christopher was a little bit of calmness uh, within ourselves. And we thought it was it, it is important during this pandemic to take a little time for ourselves, for you parents. Um, in the practice of mindfulness, uh, taking time to observe your mind is, is uh, something that we call the metacognition aspect of the, of the practice. It's to be able to really observe yourself and see what's happening and acknowledge your feelings and emotions. And we wanted to, you know, acknowledge your feelings and emotions before really to dive into the tips that we can give you. Um, we know that during this pandemic, all of you are wearing many hats. I mean, you have parents, you have co-teachers, you have professionals, workers, caregivers, and many other hats that I'm not naming right now. And that's a new thing for you, um, for all of us, in fact, to wear all those hats and to have to multitask in those ways all that from home. So let's take a little time to acknowledge those feelings and emotions. And um, I put a picture of how some of you, and hopefully not everybody, but some of you might feel stretched thin right now, or you might have felt like that a few weeks ago. And now we have been in that uh, shelter in place for over, I think eight weeks. <laughs> So you might have, um, you know, a better uh, grasp on, on where you are at with your feelings and emotions. But uh, for some of us, it's still very real that stretch thin with all we have to do. Um, I would like to uh, say that um, before um, to go a little bit further, that I have uh, been taking a few classes or uh, webinars, as we call it, through Zoom lately, one called the psychological, psychological consequences of confinement with Pascal Toscani. She's a French uh, psychologist who work in a uh, university in France and gave some uh, words of wisdom during this period of time uh, for adults in general and for uh, um, for teachers mostly. And then also I took another uh, webinar called Leading Through Challenges uh, um, offered by Kate Shepherd. And it's from an organization uh, for teachers. It's called uh, the CATDC. So the few slides that you will see um, coming up, uh, I took them from those uh, learning experience that I had myself. So I just want to give credit to those people. So as you can see, the stretch thing, uh, it was Kate Shepard through um, the organization CATDC. Can move to the next slide. I'm doing that myself. I wanted to uh, look with you at where we are during that pandemic time. Time has changed for all of us. If you if you look at it a little bit, um, it has changed. It feels like a little bit suspended, and um, I think some of us may feel a little bit. I mean, I know I feel sometimes lost in time. I don't remember if we are Wednesday or <laughs> if we are Thursday. Days are kind of crossing each other, and uh, because we are at home and. Uh, Yes, we have routines and rituals, but every day I look a little bit the same in some ways. So time has changed uh, over the past eight weeks and uh, it has triggered in uh, all of them, um, it has triggered that part of the brain that we call the amygdala. And uh, as you can see on my slides, it uh, has brought up for some of us some trauma that we had from the past. And it can be simple traumas of, um, um, I don't know, uh, 
you know, an earthquake. I mean, traumas of a moment that was difficult that we went through in our life. And those, those feelings and emotions are starting to rise again and they come back to, to our brain and to our minds. So uh, that those are memories from the past. Uh, we have also in the present right now, probably that feeling of isolation and uncertainty, and for some of us also lack of resources. And, um, and about the future, uh, we are uncertain as well, what will happen, you know, uh, um, to my loved ones, uh, to my health, to my job, we, we are not very clear. So those fears of time that usually are pretty clear when we are in our ordinary life have changed lately. And um, it, it, it is okay. I mean, we are all, and I think that's what we want to acknowledge, we are all in the same, um, on the same boat with that. Move to the next slide. So that's a slide I wanted to share, share with you. It's a French slide from uh, Pascal Toscani. It's the consequences of con confinement on people. And that's a French European perspective, I would say. And the words that have come up are traumatism, uh, trauma based on, uh, again, your past experience, symptoms of post-traumatic uh, post sym symptoms, uh, there is this feeling of, uh, I like this word in English, flabbergasted. Uh, for us in French, it's sidération, but flabbergasted, it's a, it's a good feeling. And some of us may have that feeling, feeling of stress, and also feeling of resilience that is starting to, to come up. I know uh, there is also feeling probably of loneliness, isolation, solitude, feeling of maybe culpability because when we go under stress we sometimes have reaction that we don't have usually so we might feel a little bit guilty about those reactions feeling of loss uh, loss so for, for some of us of health we might have lost our loved ones through that pandemic we might have lost our job um, and there is also that feeling of uncertainty. So that not only feelings that are observed here, in, I mean, in, the, in, in Europe, but it's also feelings that are observed here. One great slide I wanted to share with you, which is the next one. Um, that's uh, offered by Kate Shepard. And she talks about those uh, challenges and she talks about different stages of challenges. So the main four challenges she identifies uh, are being devastated, uh, being furious, being shocked, and feeling betrayed. And those have been uh, maybe, you know, the first couple of days that you were, or we were all in that pandemic, we may have felt some of those uh, feelings. And then you can see they are moving, like a devastation moves towards hope, in fact. Furious move toward healing. Shocked move toward acceptance. Betrayed moves toward care, cared for. So what uh, Kate Shepard was saying, it's like, if we look at that grid, we can take a moment to see in each, in the four categories, where do we stand? Meaning we can be feeling right now in the grieving process, but we can still feel angry and confused. And we start to feel connected again with people. So that could be my card, my map of my feelings right now. You might have totally a different map. And why we want to say that it is important that you are that you acknowledge, you know, those feelings and emotion, but also that you are kind and gentle with yourself. And um, as the title of our presentation say, that you can stay calm so you can best support your children during those unknown times. So we'll move on on the rest of the presentation. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Thank you, Magali, very much. And I'm going to build on a little bit what Magali said. And uh, Carla and I are going to uh, share uh, 
some information with you on this slide is, you know, the, through talk, you know, working with the kids through assessments, uh, surveys, and even for like, for myself, my consultations with counselors at the other independent private schools, we came up with some, some of the common things that, that the kids are experiencing and even, even uh, for the parents as well. Some of the, and this is a, a list here of some of like a, maybe the uncomfortable feelings or the uh, concerning feelings that, that have maybe come up in your household. And the first thing you want to do is kind of to build on what Magali is saying is to kind of assess where, where, where you are, your, yourself as a parent, where your, your child is, and then you can build from there to start bringing more of the calm into your, your home. Uh, I won't touch on every single one of these, but I do want to just say that, you know, first of all, these are natural feelings for what's going on. I mean, it's, it, it, somebody, it's, it's, it's more unnatural to not have anxiety uh, during this time or to not feel a little bit of sadness during this time. So th it's, these, are, these are normal reactions and expected reactions. What you want to look at, though, is, is managing the degree and intensity of these emotions. And that's really what our, our focus is, is to really help, you know, when we're feeling anxiety, instead of having the child feeling anxiety at a nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, you want to help your child bring it down to maybe a five. Um, and also to find ways to, to relieve it. Like, you know, somebody, you might have these little spikes where, you know, anxiety might be at a five out of 10, for example, and then that spikes up to a 10 out of 10, but you know how to bring it down. Like I know uh, talking with students, one, when he starts feeling a little bit tense or whatever, he'll go and do backflips on a trampoline for five minutes or somebody else, another student will walk their dog or just to have those ways to bring your, to bring the, the, the intensity of those feelings down. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I just wanna to touch on a few and then Carla, I'll let you jump in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that you want to look for with anxiety is, uh, you know, kids are gonna express it uh, in, in various ways. You're looking for nervousness. Uh, you, it, oh, first of all, let me step back and say, you know your child. So kind of, you know, remember what, your, what kind of where the baseline is of your child was before this, you know, distance learning and the, this pandemic started. And, um, you know, some, some kids might be a little bit already on the anxious side or a little bit more on the sad side or a little bit more energetic. So kind of know your child and then look for like, you know, changes. Are they more nervous than normal, more irritable, maybe having, having fears that they didn't have? Um, or having weird dreams or scary dreams, um, physical ailments that, um, you know, headaches, ten tension. So those are some of the things that you want to look for a child. And also, I'm going to jump down here, like the same with the sadness and depressed. How is that going to express itself? And that's where you know, you're seeing maybe hopelessness, lack of motivation, um, um, just feeling worthless or, 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 or low. Um, and so these, these are some of the emotions that, that we're gonna feel. Do you wanna add some things, Carla? No, I think you've covered um, most of the situations. I think especially with younger students, um, we've seen a lot of you know, sleeping difficulties, um, keeping up with routines and patterns and um, the social isolation has mm -hmm. definitely been um, one of the biggest concerns, you know, children missing their friends and their connections, their physical connections with um, their teachers and their, their friends at school being able to play. You know, a lot of them say, you know, Zoom is great, but it's not the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that comes over time with that aspect. Um, another thing that definitely has come up a lot has been the difficulty dealing with mistakes and being able to accept those, those situations and a little bit more the um, oversensitivity to situations or new things that have popped up that never really came up with homework, but now are coming up with being able to do activities at home. So those are some of the things that I think with the younger students we've been able to um, observe. I might add, just add one, one aspect to that too, and it was for, I was trying to look at the names of, of who is here to see how many, what age group we have in terms like the, the preteens and the, the middle schoolers. You're, you're, this is a, you know, but developmentally, this is a time where the kids should really be, you know, starting to separate from their parents and form that their identity, have that more independence. And then this, this is like a contradiction automatically, you know, these kids are at home just with their parents all the time. And, and for what, what I have seen with some of the, the middle schoolers is even more conflicts for that independence because they're already 
aren't getting that independence. So a, a child may be asking even more, like let, not let you involved in in the work with their studies that they that they used to be able to be involved in, or even demanding more privacy than they used to because there's not they're not getting that that chance to to separate from you during the day daytime and. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more with solutions. And I know that came up as a question as well. And I think on the opposite end with the younger ones, we notice a little bit more of that clinginess. Um, even children who were already playing independently um, might be asking a little bit more uh, of attention from their parents uh, of wanting to do that. So we kind of have the opposite ends of that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so this is uh, this slide here. I, I read a fantastic article, and I put the link to it down at the bottom. It is coming? This uh, I just summarize just real briefly. You know, will the pandemic have a lasting impact on my 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 kids? And uh, the the research psychologist that wrote this had taken a lot of different studies from you know survivors of World War II or survivors of of a, 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 the Holocaust. Um, survivors of natural disasters, just all kinds of things up to the present, including, you know, 9-11. Uh, um, and what they found is that those, those children that were able to bounce back, live regular lives, had, there, was, there were these four things in common. And that you'll read the article, you can get more, more in depth in it. But it's really talking about how the, the degree and level of exposure that they had to the event uh, and so like in this case, when we're looking at the pandemic is, especially with the younger kids, you want to, you want to buffer what they're exposed to. You know, you want to be able to answer the questions of, for them and not let them get so much information from the media or, or, um, uh, or the, so too, too much exposures and, and then the level of it as well. With older kids, you, you kind of have to find that, that balance with them. The, you know, the middle school kids can handle more, you know, information. Uh, but so it had to do around exposure and then having a loving caregiver. And in that aspect, it was really like if, if, a, if a child and some of, the, some of these studies are really interesting to read it. If a child was with their parent who was loving and caring, it doesn't have to be a parent, it could be just be a caregiver, actually, that, that's a loving caregiver who was loving and calm, even if they were, uh, there was bombing going on next to their house, like in World War II, or even if they were directly, you know, lost their house during like the, the hurricane uh, Katrina all those that 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 almost served, the, the parents served as a buffer to to the child and i was thinking of the 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 yeah the the calmness that that when you can even if you're anxious as a parent if you're able to get your feelings balanced when you when you talk with your child the, the, that sense of calm and i kind of think about when you fly and when we used to be able to fly that you could um on an airline, when you hit when you hit turbulence, when the pilot comes on and the pilot is calm, you know, I don't for me at least automatically brings a calmness. But I've had pilots come on and say we're going to hit turbulence. They sound stressed and they sound you know tense, and that all of a sudden your stress level goes up. So kind of think of that in terms of how you you talk with your child. And then the 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 the, the fourth one was just any type of like you know if you have a uh, uh, you know religions really help with with you know providing some type of, of basis for uh, um, um, resilience, but if you don't have any type of spiritual traditions, it could be, you know, especially in the Bay Area where you have such a broad range of, of, of philosophies, you know, you have some type of strong philosophies that you follow or something that to give, you know, your child a sense of purpose and meaning. Maybe it might be going out and helping those, those people that are in, in need or something, but that, to have something to kind of anchor them and, and broaden that, that um, experience to helping, helping others in the process. Um, and then I'm going to just plug one more book. Uh, there was an article. Is uh, people might be familiar with Dan Siegel. He's uh, he's he wrote the Whole Brain Child. I went to. I he holds actually weekly um, uh, sessions now every Friday. But he wrote this book called The Power of Showing Up. And it really it's 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 and I'll put this reference on, on the on the slide. Really, he's talking about the the same things too about providing safety, security, soothing to your your child. But this is a most recent recent book that he just came out in January, and it really covers those. Um, I'd highly recommend it to, you know, especially uh, families with, with younger children. Okay, great. All right, so we're gonna moving into kind of more uh, practical tips and things that you can be able to do and um, to create a calm and healthy home environment. 
Um, so kind of like what we always talked about is looking at the moment and being able to prioritize, prioritize what is most important for you and family right now. Um, and being able to be in tune with those emotions that we've talked about and seeing where you are at. Um, next is being able to listen to your child's emotions and their feelings. You know, being able to acknowledge and validate their, their emotions as much as yours, giving them a safe space where they can express themselves, where they could be able to talk how they're feeling, um, and be able to give them moments where they know that that could be a constant evolution of their feelings. And, you know, what they're feeling right now is not what is going to always be true later on in the day or tomorrow. Douglas, don't, you can jump in anytime you want oh, to. <laughs> I, would, I was just going to say, too, in addition to what you're saying there, Carla, is it, it's really important is to validate what your child is feeling. That sometimes, uh, especially for me as a counselor, or I see, I see it with teachers, you know, somebody's upset and your, 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 your tendency, your instinct is to jump in and make them feel better. And first, I, what, what I find that kids need more is just first acknowledge that, hey, they're, they're feeling bad, they're feeling down and just be with them for that feeling. And I, I will often ask a child, you know, do you, do you need to express yourself more? Do you need to talk more about your sadness? Or are you ready to, to, to talk about maybe ways you can, we can make you feel better or things that we could do to, to help? To follow, follow your child's um, lead on that. Because sometimes, I mean, I've had kids say to me, I just needed to get that off my chest. I just needed to express it and somebody to, to validate that this, this is bad. You know, I feel bad or whatever. So that's, um, so try to do that because the in instinct is to jump in and try to solve the thing mm -hmm. with your child and stay with them for a while. A bit. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to continue to foster a growth mindset. So, being able to giving them a safe space to to make mistakes, um, you know, acknowledge them and and help them to solve problems together and not for them in that aspect that we were talking about. Um, I think one thing that's really important to remember is that this situation of distance learning, the, for children, the main goal is not to replicate their typical school day. That's just impossible, right? Um, so what we, the goal is to keep them continue to feel connected to their school community, to their teachers, to their classmates, to the learning process. But remember, this is not exactly what they would be doing at school every single day. So, you know, that's why we always reinforce that for them to be able to go to the Zoom meetings, for them to be present at the Google Meets, is probably the most important part of their day because that is what continues to foster their connection. You know, routines is, you know, are extremely important. They give children a sense of safety and familiarity, especially at a time where, you know, as Magali said, it seems like time standing still. Um, it is easy for that to get muddled. Um, and for things to get a little bit offbeat. But keeping routines as much as possible, you know, having a usual wake up time, having a bedtime routine, having, you know, those family meals, having that, that, those routines that gives kids a sense of safety and a normalcy in all of this. You know, making healthy choices, getting out to, to exercise, taking a family walk together, making sure that we're keeping up a healthy diet and our sleeping patterns, um, being flexible with expectations. Things aren't business as usual. So, you know, we need to roll with the punches and be flexible with it. Um, we're going to have, you know, as Douglas was saying before, you know, we're going to have mood swings. We're going to have different spikes in our emotions. So being flexible with that and being able to know that we need to adapt when necessary and trying to keep things light and fun. Um, we need to be able to keep those social connections. That's important to avoid the social isolation. Having, you know, game nights, whether it's with friends on Zoom or with family at home, being able to cook together or having, you know, family movie nights. Um, as Douglas mentioned before, you know, minimizing the kids' exposure to, to media, 
and other content that could be triggers, not just for them, but for yourself too. Um, and last, uh, I love this analogy. It's, you know, like on the plane, when they say, you know, you need to put your oxygen mask first to be able to help others too. Right. So being able to focus on self-care and being able to be attentive to your own physical and emotional needs so that you can be able to do that for um, your child too. <clears throat> it's important <clears throat> to carve out space for yourself, whether that means, you know, a five minute meditation, you know, outside or, you know, locking yourself in the bathroom to just have a couple of time to yourself. It's whatever it may be, but allowing that time for yourself is important to kind of reset and to be more ready for your child too. And I want to add just one thing um, uh, with, with Carla saying is, is, you know, our kids are, are still at very different developmental stages and we have to really be kind of their executive functioning for them at times that, that they haven't developed. I mean, some, maybe some of the seventh and eighth graders are getting better at it, you know, being able to develop that, the, the planning, the structure to, 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 to think ahead, control that impulsivity. The younger ones, they, they need, may need us more to step in and be that for them. Um, and like, a child, you know, like we know that a child needs to get outside. They need to get outside. They need to be in the sunlight. They need to move. And if they don't, you sometimes have to step in and say, you got to go out. You know, I'm not giving you the choice. You're going to go out. You're going to walk around the block or, or you're going to sit outside in the sun for a little bit. But you, you, we have to sometimes just step in more so than maybe in the past. Okay, sorry. Go ahead uh, to the next slide. Carla. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'll just add some um, ideas that might be helpful for you at home. Um, so starting here first, I wrote practice meditation and mindfulness. So it's hard. I know everybody's got schedules and it's tough to really find the time to do things. But I honestly think if you were just to put aside three minutes a day, just to ground yourself and focus on your breath and meditate just to, um, you know, just feel better and try to calm your mind and your body. It can uh, lower stress and anxiety. It's very uh, helpful tool. And then mindfulness, I just wanted to be sure that we all knew what it was. It's just about being present in the moment and being aware of how you're feeling in that moment. And um, it's not about being calm and happy and or escaping. It's just about, you know, really being in that moment and embracing it with all of your heart and your mind. Um, and mindfulness also should be something about building skills to be resilient and on point as often as we're able. So it's not just about being happy and calm. Um, another suggestion would be to create family time together outdoors regularly. I know a lot of you already do this and I'm sure it's, oh, you know, that great time in the day feels so good to do it. Um, but we all have to remember to take breaks um, from being inside. Uh, as Douglas had mentioned, how important it is just to kind of, you know, talk to our kids and let them know, hey, this is going to be good for you. Go for it. So uh, I said here, exercising in nature time can help with mood enhancement, better sleep and receptivity to learning. Um, you can find that the kids can really regroup and refocus once they're back and uh, have had that time outside. Um, play, create and read out loud together. Um, it's a really fun thing to, you know, pick a book that works for all ages and you can all take turns reading or the kids are too young, just the adults reading, but it's a nice um, activity to do with one another uh, as an alternative to anything screen related. So I said here, we're all struggling and experiencing stress. When you engage in play or family, family activities, it can enhance communication, lift up your spirits, keeps us connected and it reassures our kids that everything's okay. Okay, and then I wrote, listen, empathize, be receptive and compassionate. So sometimes we're really caught up in, you know, having our phones in our hands and we're not, you know, present and we're not really accessible. So it's important that we, you know, lift up our heads and we uh, practice active listening and try not to be distracted and really, truly be there for our loved ones. 
that are around us. And I can't read the bottom here on mine. Maybe we can go to the next slide. It's okay. All right, so stay connected to friends and the people you love. I tell this to all the kids in the SEL classes that Zooming and calling and social distance play dates and visits, if that's what you're doing, that's cool. And then I even tell the kids to write letters, you know, get, get it into the old snail mail thing. And, and it's a nice way to focus energy and attention to people that you miss and to do something nice for them. And I think that uh, that perpetuates a sense of normalcy and stresses the importance of real connection um, during these hard times. So I also um, want to emphasize the importance of processing and sitting with emotions. You know, try not to stuff them away. That if you're feeling something, embrace it. If you need a moment, go walk away or have a drink, uh, spend some time outside, whatever. Try not to react. It's not always easy when we're in that heated moment, but uh, do your best to uh, sit with it and let it pass. But also we have to realize we have to pick our own battles. Sometimes we have to just let it go <laughs> and that's totally fine. And you can revisit it later. So it's okay to express how you feel and that you sometimes need a moment. Don't put so much pressure on yourself to be perfect allow for imperfections. This is really important because I know a lot of us are, you know, kind of hard on ourselves and we want the best for our family and our kids, but, you know, just take some breaks, take some pauses and realize that we're in this together. All of us are in this together and this is a, our commonality and that, um, you know, you got to be good to yourself as well. So, um, and also keep in mind that Keeping your feelings inside can create resentment and misunderstanding. So when possible, communicate your needs and your feelings whenever you can. And then, of course, help your kids to do this as well. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, so the last is, hopefully the, um, we can give this to you guys so you can have this. These are open-ended or learning questions when dealing with the conflict. So they're questions that you pose to your kids if they've done something wrong or if they've had a fight with another sibling. So you want to try to use these kind of questions um, that the opposite of judging. So a positive way to deal with the conflict might be, how did you interpret that? And an, you know, the judging version would be, who did it first? So we'll just focus on the questions on the left here. You can see what it says. The more positive, more open-ended questions are like, what's going on for you? What do you need from the other person? What do you think would help? You wanna to try to foster um, dialogue in order for you to help the kids get solutions. So they're often able to do it as well as long as they're kind of directed. So other ways to talk to them in a positive way when dealing with a conflict would be, what do you think would help? How is that for you? What is important to you about that? What did that make you think about? And then at the bottom, it says, the goal of using these kinds of questions is, is to get our kids to talk and communicate their needs and issues, not to make them feel like you're interrogating them. So that's important too. All right. Thanks for listening. I think we have some questions that we could answer now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't see any questions on the chat, so don't feel free to ask them there if you want. Uh, we'll go through a couple questions that, are, that were submitted in advance. The first question is regarding motivation of students and children around their activities and homework during distance learning. I can actually relate because I'm, I'm feeling that with my own child. It's really hard to get them motivated uh, to do the work. And as parents, we worry that they are falling behind and, and, and not getting all their academic skills. So what, what do you say to that? I don't know who wants to jump in. Um, well, I think, you know, again, being able to kind of have that open conversation with them and being able to gauge where they at and 
you know, understanding what is behind their lack of motivation. Um, is it something that they're finding? Is it boring for them? Is it hard for them? You know, being able to understand where they're at. Um, also, maybe being able to sit down with them and make a small schedule, um, kind of be able to uh, prioritize some of the activities which they can find, you know, that is easier for them or the funnest for them and kind of sandwich them in with, in, with other ones that are a little bit more difficult, making sure to take breaks. Um, we know that spending a lot of time on the screen does induce a lot more fatigue. Um, so it is important to be introducing a lot of breaks throughout the day to keep that motivation going. Um, you know, and, and I'd be able to gauge with them, you know, when is it time to kind of step in and say, okay, we need to maybe stop today and then tomorrow we'll, we'll, we'll continue. Um, and that's okay. And, and remember, we talked about flexibility. So that is really important. Um, having open communication with the teachers and being able to talk about where your child is and any challenges that they might be having at this time. Now, I would add, first of all, it's very, it's very common and I'm seeing that, you know, that motivational problems. I've heard a range of diff different things from students uh, about that. Um, and one, one thing too is that to add on to what Carla has said is, find out what, what, what is going on with that motivation. Like I've had, you know, one student that was having trouble getting motivated because she's at home, you know, doing class from her bedroom and it doesn't feel serious to her. It doesn't feel like she's in school. Um, I have others that, that it just felt overwhelming. They just couldn't keep up with the work. And so we had to go with that student and, and break down their assignments a little bit more so that they could just focus on one thing at a time because that being able to just focus on one science assignment at a time as opposed to eight help them get motivated enough so they can could move forward but definitely with you know diet kind of assess what the problem what, what what's causing that that lack of motivation but it's, it's a tough thing to to deal with and it's a common thing okay. um the next question is about screen time so a little bit related to what you're just talking about but screen time can induce a lot of um bad mood in kids actually even young but also older kids um, so it's kind of a question for a, a wide range of students. How do you deal with, uh, you know, students spending a bit more, too much time in front of the screen these days and dealing with the tantrums or the, the just the, the, you know, the bad mood that, that taking the screen away creates? Uh, this can be, uh, you see a lot of that in kids. How do you deal with that? I'll jump in there. Uh, I would say that, uh, what I tell the kids in SEL about screen time is that obviously use it for school, school related activities as uh, minimally as possible. But I also tell them that, you know, if they're into video games and doing other things that they should really just not do that as, as much. But if they're creating and they're doing um, educational things and the screen is part of that, that I understand and that that's okay. But again not to do it too much and then of course provide um, real alternatives to them you know fun things that they can do that are not screen related so you just have to use your creative mind to come up with some good ideas i, I want sorry douglas i just wanted to jump just for the youngest one i would like to say that uh, they um what carla said earlier to have a schedule a clear schedule of their time uh, is important and to with them to clarify you know how long they will be on the screen and uh, um, and then what's happening next so they're on the screen for I don't know 15 minutes with their teacher and then after that they will have to um, you know, go for a walk with you or help to uh, empty the dishwasher or having a clear routine with the younger children is super important and also uh, one thing I, I like, it's always the user, the use of timer and having a little timer even on your phone and next to you and telling your children, okay, that's how long you have to be on the screen, on the Zoom or anything. And then, you know, after that, once the timer uh, rings, then we'll pass to the next activity. So I think those clear uh, schedule boundaries and um, guidelines are important for the children and for them to know them in advance. And there are some um, 
really good, like even parental control, like apps and things like that, that can help either create schedules um, where you can kind of put them on and off and even help with distraction. I know a lot of kids, um, I've had kids kind of like in the upper elementary range that talk about like, oh, when I'm working on the iPad, I get distracted because there's all these other apps that I can go to. So even with their work, um, and um, one app that I have used lots of times is called actually Hour Pact. And you can be able to monitor. So for example, during a certain time, only these apps that they're gonna use for educational reasons will be available while the other ones will magically disappear and will only reappear during a scheduled time that you have predetermined. So um, those, those kind of uh, controls really help a lot. Um, and also if a child knows how much time that they will be allowed, that will kind of already prevent some of the issues that before, because they already know ahead of time. So anticipating some of the situations will be better than, you know, all of a sudden you're cutting them off and say, okay, too much time. Um, so that way, if they already know that they are allowed only 15 or 20 minutes, um, and, and be very conscious about what that screen time is. So, you know, if you're going to allow them screen time, make that kind of like a family time that you're doing. Like if you want to watch a movie together, or if you want to do that versus kind of individual isolating activities. So, um, but definitely, you know, as Douglas was saying before, sometimes we're going to have to make those decisions for them about like what activities they're going to be engaged in. Um, Cause they might not, they'll be just saying, oh, I'm bored. I have nothing to do. Um, so we might have to give them a lot of different options of what that looks like. Okay. Carla, you can add that, that. Oh, sorry, Douglas. I just want to add just one other part on that, just that, because I, I think also there's a little bit of flexibility, uh, depending on what they're, they're doing. Because I, I know, especially with middle schoolers that I'm talking to, it's their only way of connecting with their friends. And so they are spending a little bit more time. If they're connecting with their friends, like I know one that had, you know, had a birthday party together on, on, on Zoom, um, or they're, um, doing lunch together it's i guess to, to also see what how what that time how that time is being used because if it's if that's the only way for your your teenager to connect with a, a their friends then sometimes you have to get a little bit find that balance i guess all right go ahead okay yeah it is it is 9 49 so it's officially over but um we had one more question which i think is, is important that was submitted early on um, and I, I just want to add that we'll add the name of the parental control app in the, in the presentation because some parents might find that useful. Um, the last question is more for teenagers. Uh, how do you keep, uh, how do you help keep your teenager stay engaged socially? Many parents are concerned yeah. about their child yeah. being alone, isolated, and as a result, depressed. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is a, a tough one. And that's, I mean, one, that's what I was, I guess, uh, to, to, to add on to my, my previous answer is um, try to, you know, let them connect with the friends if that's their way to do it, if they have to do it through, through Zoom. Um, the, um, encourage them to maybe even try to, con you know, connect, say, like, I was thinking of even like, go, going to class, make sure they're going to, to class each day, that there's, there's times within each of the um, beginning of class or to end where, where you can connect with the other kids. Or when I've been in the, the, the classrooms, it's been a nice time for them to, to be engaged and, and see, see their peers. So make sure that they're going to class, maybe taking advantage of those other times when they could see the other, the, their, their peers. Um, depending on your comfort level, and I know several um, middle schoolers have done this, and I even have talked with my colleague who is at, at Head Royce, who has done this with some of the younger kids, is they arrange like physically distant play dates where they'll actually meet at a field. And I've seen kids do it where they're far, they're far away. You know, they're keeping six to 10 feet distance, but at least they can be physically see each other and, or they'll be even kicking a soccer ball or just being able to talk, or maybe even see if there's ways that you can let them socialize that way. Um, and it might even take, you know, I'd gladly help if, um, you know, parents need some guidance, you know, trying to, to, parents talking with other parents to set up things as well. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's tough. But I, I see that with the, with, with the kids, some of them feeling more isolated in that sense. I think we see that with all, all age, 
groups and I mean even with the youngest one what we recommend it's for parents to organize sometimes play dates and I, I know some families who just uh, you know organize play dates with the other families and the children are in their bedrooms with uh, with the zoom and they show their toys and they share mm -hmm. stories you know whatever like a three or four years old can do they they do it so um, I think that social time is uh, super important these days. And I think this is particularly true, especially for um, children who don't have siblings, where mm -hmm. that isolation has become even um, more evident. So uh, being able to organize play dates, and I think that now as we're starting to move, especially a little bit forward with a little bit of the reopening and um, the relaxation of um, the, the stay at home orders, it's you know, if we can keep the social distancing, but more physical contact, that's important so that they can be able to see each other. So being meeting at a park, um, you know, I know that especially now with a lot of like uh, transitions for like eighth grade and fifth grade, the promotions, um, being have the importance to have closure because a lot of kids will be transitioning either to other schools or other situations. Um, so having a chance to say goodbye is important too. Um, so, you know, being able to have some kind of celebration, whether with some of their friends, you know, it, would, it means at a parking lot where each can have their own little space and keep that distance, but they can physically, you know, they can be able to see each other without being through the screen. That, that, that's going to be important to, to make that transition for sure. Okay. All right. I think that concludes our webinar. Uh, thank, I really want to thank Carla, Christopher, Megaly, and Douglas for their wise tips i know i've um i i got uh, some good ideas for my own child so thank you really so much for preparing and, and organizing this workshop